There's 18,000 signatures there that we've collected. Interestingly, it comes from all sorts of demographics as we paddle down the coast. Everyone there agrees that we have a climate emergency and we need to do something about it. We hardly found anyone who didn't think that we had an emergency and just wished that our governments would do something about it. So this is nearly 20,000 signatures and it's the start. Well done. Good on you. That's great. Right. For me, it was when you sit down and read the sitting down and reading the science and understanding just how quickly we've got to move, and especially in a country like Australia that's essentially built up its energy system as a series of lines out to coal mines. You understand the speed of the transition that we've um, got to undertake, and uh, it can be pretty disheartening up in this place when you know that the science says we've got a very short time if we haven't already missed certain tipping points. Um, to then hear debates still occurring about whether climate change is real, let alone um, what we do to act on it. Um, but a couple of things, I guess, give me give me heart. Um, one is that if you look back over the last few years, when the financial system got in trouble, um, world leaders came together in a very short period of time and found trillions of dollars to bail out uh, the banks. And my hope is that. Um, one day we'll treat the planet with the same respect that we do merchant banks. And that we might, in the same way that we could get people together to act that swiftly when faced with the collapse of one kind of system, um, that we may be able to do something uh, similar again. And I think in that respect, elevating the question of emergency is absolutely critical because I think it's, it's people need to understand this isn't something that's going to happen in the future, it's happening now. And the decisions that we make over the next few years are going to determine what the, what the future is going to be like and also um, whether or not what we're seeing now is the new normal uh, or is even going to get a lot worse. I hope that over the coming um, weeks and months that we can um, start to shift debates and people understand what it is that we've actually signed up to and that that means an emergency response. And um, I know, John, some of the work you've done in the private sector, I, I hope that we can start happening uh, through government as well. I asked the Reserve Bank on Friday at the Economics Committee whether they've considered the Paris Agreement at any of their board discussions and whether they've considered what a two degree glide path actually means for Australia's economy, what it means for stranded assets, what it means for coal, and what it means for gas. They said no because we can't discuss everything. Um, but mean, and so we haven't considered climate change. And meanwhile, the Governor of the Reserve Bank of England is ringing the, the alarm bells, APRA is ringing the alarm bells, saying this is a big, big question for the Australian economy. And I hope that over the next weeks and months we can get the government to start, and if not the leadership of the government, at least some of the organs and institutions of government to understand what's needed. Because um, two degrees or two less one and a half means nothing short of an emergency response. And um, I'm really, really pleased that you're bringing it to the fore publicly and you will have our full support in trying to make that emergency response a reality. Thank you very much and, and thank you for the invite to represent Labor at this uh, a very important event, and I'm proud to represent the only political party that, as a government, has legislated a price on carbon. And I'm very proud of that, and we don't resolve from that. And the fact that we have a very strong climate change policy that, if we'd elected, if we were elected last year, would have had um, as our target net zero emissions by 2050 and 2030 targets that reflected uh, the considered views of the climate change authority. So we, we certainly recognise that we need to take very strong action on climate change, that ideally it should be bipartisan and again we saw another missed opportunity late last year to do that and uh, we're very keen to uh, work with the community to really drive the transition to make sure that we take climate change seriously and uh, are recognising that this is so urgent that it needs the entire community's actions, not just politicians to drive it. So thank you very much for being part of this. Yeah, I guess I'm here as the token Liberal. <laughs> Look at the polls today, who knows what's happening in the Liberal Harvard. Party. But they're not paying enough attention, obviously, to this to this issue. I'm reminded today, Adam, that uh, the uh, Academy Awards are on. You may remember when DiCaprio won his award, he made a very passionate speech about the emergency you know, in relation to climate. 
we've lost a bit more time since then. I think we've lost a lot of time. As you said, a couple of decades, two or three decades that I've been involved in this issue. And I just see endless opportunities going by the board in terms of domestic business, jobs and growth, might I say. But on the other side, I mean, we've left it pretty much too late. Emergency is a, a word that's overused in politics, but this is, the climate is an emergency. Uh, I think we're probably at all past a tipping point in terms of getting net zero emissions as a minimum by 2050. Mm. We have objectives now for the Paris climate talks, 26 to 28 per cent by 2030. I'd like to see some level of bipartisanship and leadership and bipartisanship to outline the transition path we're going to take to achieve those objectives over that time frame. We haven't got a lot of time left. We are going to miss the renewable energy target, I think, in 2020. Uh, and so there's quite a lot to be done. And it's not a debate about short-term political point scoring or you know, renewables versus coal versus... It's, it's about putting down a sensible and deliverable transition process because the private sector is going to have to make some pretty long-term investment decisions. They need a degree of certainty, a clear sense of direction. And uh, we're not getting it out of the current political process. Ian Dunlop, I'd just like to congratulate Steve on the effort he's made, not just in his trip from Ballina over the last few weeks, but in the trip to Paris he made prior to the Paris climate change meeting. It's very clear that climate change is moving far faster and far more rapidly than we're being told about officially. All of the arguments we've currently got about problems in our electricity grids and so on has got absolutely nothing to do with renewables or whatever. It's all to do with the fact we've had 20 years of inaction and denial from both major political parties. We've now left it too late to make a gradual transition from a high carbon to a low carbon economy. We have to move to some form of emergency action. We have the solutions, we have the science, the technology, we have the engineering expertise to do it. It has to be done very quickly. What we now need is the leadership to go with that. If it's not going to come from politics, as seems to be the case, then it's going to be coming from other parts of society. And what we need is the political leadership to get in behind that and support it as fast as we can. Because all of the objectives that our political leaders are talking about, jobs, innovation, growth and so on, come from addressing this problem. They don't come from trying to perpetuate a 20th century economy as they are currently trying to do. So we need to change the paradigm, change the thinking and get moving. Thank you. Oh look, I'm just really pleased to be here. You know, I entered politics because I wanted to see action on climate and knowing that we, we haven't got a future. You know, if we keep on polluting like there's no tomorrow, well then there will be no tomorrow. And so, you know, for all of us, to bring all Australians together to be recognising that this is incredibly urgent and that we need an emergency scale response to deal with it is something myself and all of our friends are in I just want to give particular thanks to John um, because having been in this movement for a long time, people do get worn down, but they do have some hope. And obviously, I'm usually very critical of the Liberals and Nationals and people in their party. But when we've got emergencies, when there's big, <laughs> <laughs> when there's big issues that we need to find to come together, and John has given exceptional leadership. And thank you to Ian. Like at, at the moment, this is about all of us, and the leadership you're given is noted and is appreciated. So thanks to Ian and John. I remember something very distinctive about what Adam said, I think it was 2009, when you said that you recognised that we do actually face a climate emergency. You know, and it's taken us some years to actually move from understanding that we, have, we are in a climate emergency to recognising that we need to take emergency action. And so I have great pleasure, on behalf of others, but I mean, that's not my job, <laughs> to, um, to be able to, to bring this, this process to the Parliament where we can um, begin the debate about how we can actually engage in a climate emergency response. Excellent. Thank you. Very Thanks. Much. Thank you. I think as part of today's proceedings, I just wanted to reflect on the role of engineers in society. So engineering is about the creation or application of technology to produce goods and services for the community. So we find solutions to problems. Uh, everything you, you see in the built environment has been designed by engineers. Uh, the roads we travel on, the building we're standing against, the water and energy networks that provide our basic human needs. And Australia has over 400,000, nearly 400,000 engineers in the workforce. 
So, and I know that engineers are working on sustainable uh, projects at, at, as we speak, things like the rural sector. Uh, that's a great definition of engineering, but one thing it doesn't do is touch on the leadership that's required, and that's really what Steve is doing, Steve and his team providing leadership. So it's not enough just to respond to the problems of society, uh, we need to lead the debate and influence public policy, so I'm very happy to be a part of this event. Thank you, Steve. Most of all, I want to add my thanks to that man over there for kayaking. He left here two years ago from Engineering House, towed his kayak up and down into the sea and out, went up the Mississippi, nearly died in the floods coming down the Mississippi, across to England, over the canals, over the channel, down the coast of France, and up the Seine to the Eiffel Tower. And that was a real thrill to see the kayak in front of the Eiffel Tower. And then he thought, he had a year's rest, and then he thought, <laughs> I've got to get back to Canberra. So on the 1st of January, he put old Yellow in the water at Ballina, and he's come down the coast over the last two months with some fantastic meetings, fantastic signatures. I think when you left, there was only 10,000 on that? Six. 6,000, there's now 18,100. That's fantastic. So thank you, Steve. You're a hero, mate. Thank you for that.